Teresa Copeland, and I want to invite you to my show, The Big Sell. Are you ready to stop being a small player in a big world? Are you ready to decommoditize your business? Are you ready to stand aside from the competition? Join me every week on The Big Sell. Hi, everybody. It's Lisa Copeland, and welcome to The Art of The Big Sell, where I bring to you the biggest, most fabulous sellers in the world, the industry experts. No room for fakes on my show. And today's no different. Sean Crabtree, he is an absolute sales rock star. He's the founder of the Crabtree Group in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, we have been sitting here, I've never even done this, 45 minutes before the show started, we, we sat here and talked and talked and talked and talked. And we probably could have gone on all day because that's what big sellers do. You know, you if you're a big seller and you meet another big seller, then you're automatically connected. So everybody, I want to introduce you to Sean Crabtree. Hi, Sean. Welcome to the show. Lisa, thank you so much for having me. I, I tell you what, I am honored to be in the presence of the biggest big seller. <laughs> I you love are. it when people suck up. I just Talk think about it's it. awesome. <laughs> Listen, when it's real, it's not sucking up. Okay, I have to ask you about that fabulous background. I'm sitting here, I am, I'm having envy right now. Yeah. About your studio. Tell us about that beautiful. I know it's the Nashville skyline, but is that a painting? Is it a picture? Is no, no. It a this is a, this is an actual picture of the Nashville skyline, and as you can tell, of course, uh, now it's actually a gorgeously beautiful sunny day today. But this is the uh, this is one of the the highlights of the Nashville skyline. They call it the Batman Building. Yeah. And uh, here's some attorneys that I've paid lots and lots of money to right there, Baker Donaldson. But uh, we won't give them any press. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's. Uh, that is the actual Nashville skyline right there. I love it. Well, I mean, I've just had so much fun the last 45 minutes really getting to know you. So tell us about the Crabtree Group. Tell us what you do and why you do it. Well, you know, and by the way, I, I should tell everybody, listen, that we have, we're expanding here. We're, we've outgrown the room in, 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 uh, in our office. So there's, can they hear that, Mr. Producer? I, can, um, I can't hear any of it. So I think, okay. I think we're in good shape. So as long as there's not stuff falling from the ceiling, we'll be okay. You probably heard that. Because otherwise but, people might think it's dandruff. So we have to Exactly, <laughs> right. There's a lot of construction going on. So and all I, this stuff comes onto your nice, beautiful black suit right. and all this white flaky stuff, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's from the ceiling. Okay? It's That's coming right. from the construction. It's coming from the construction. So, right. so the Crabtree Group, so we are business strategists. Um, I mean, talk about sales. Here's what we do. We find out as much as we can about who it is, how it is, what it is that our clients want from their business. We find out as much as we can about sort of where it is that they are across all departments. And then we help them develop strategies to be able to get from where it is to where they want to be. And then we hold their hand every single step of the way and push them and pull them and hug them and drag them and whatever else it takes so that those strategies are being implemented daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly. We are, you would call us, uh, consultants, but but we differentiate that um, in a very big way because you call yourself a strategist, though, which is what yes. I do, and then you can charge more money than a consultant. Can. <laughs> Listen, it's in the orchestration, right? <laughs> no, we're all in how you prop we, it up. We are fully immersed, and and so you know, as you and I were talking, I mean, what we're selling is you talk about the big sale. I mean, we are selling the intangible, the ultimate intangible. There's absolutely no product here. Um, and our contracts are, are, are pretty big. Uh, we have to deliver. We're very good at what we do. Our, um, our clients will grow uh, 48 to 50%. They'll do that in normally the first 12 months. It's not uncommon for, the, for, for, for our guys to grow 100%. Um, but as How a whole, do you do that? I mean, are you finding, are you getting, um, you're late, you're, you're just teeing expenses? it right up. You're just, you're teeing it up for me, aren't you? I'm teeing you up. I have a lot of dental friends that I know yes. I'm going to send this show to. And well, I appreciate that. And I, and I didn't say that, that, you know, our clients are in the healthcare and among the many things that we do in terms of the general business acumen parts, the sales is the most important part. Because doctors and physicians and dentists, they're not salespeople, they're healers. They're healers and they very much care about their patients. And I mean, uh, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them haven't yet understood that they need to embrace the concept of sales. Now I know you can hear that. Sorry. No, it's all good. Good. I hope you can't hear it. Okay. 
These guys are banging away up there. But um, yeah, so, you know, um, creating an organizational behavior, operating within the confines of that organizational behavior, creating systematic approaches with tracking and all of that. And yet sales is the biggest thing. It's what got me into this business uh, a little over 21 years ago. How did you figure out that niche? I mean, so many of are the big sellers, so many salespeople say to me all the time, they're like, Lisa, you know, how do I find the best niche for me that I can make the most money? And you know, how did you find yours? I, you know, I started in direct sales, as I know a lot of people who are listening and watching this are in direct sales. I love direct sales. I am direct sales. I, that is who I am. Um, there's nothing that I love more than that. Right out of college, I started into a brand new industry called, at the time, cellular telephony. Now they call it telecommunications. But this is in the late 80s and the early 90s. We're talking dinosaur days of this technology, right? It was all analog. That's when the big phone, that's when the phones were the big ones. Like, you know, I actually had a, phone that had a bag, had a leather bag, the bags. Yep. Yeah. They were, they were three Watts. And then we had the smaller ones. Um, you know, uh, we, the industry as all industries do when they mature, they started to roll up. There started to be a lot of consolidation. And we, when we started, literally there were six of us that made all the decisions. I had complete control over the sales in my um, tri-state sort of area. Um, I had total control, total autonomy in terms of what I did and how I did and how I took care of my people. And, um, you know, it was all about creating value. As the industry started to roll up, everything became more and more corporatized. My hands started becoming more and more tied. And actually, I got recruited by a client um, who, if you're familiar with Tony Robbins, um, this is when Tony was, of course, this is years ago. Tony was selling really tapes. Tony was, Tony was, was, was really making a, a big splash and, and, you know, he was the, the young star back then. And, and so um, I got recruited by a wet finger dentist who was partnered with Tony and I totally jumped ship. I, I, I went into that business and um, you know, worked with Tony for, for lots and lots of years. Um, I, I was so excited, you know, what got me into this, the real thing that did it was sales at the end of the day, it was sales. I came from a group of about six of us who made all these decisions and I had total autonomy as we continued to roll up. When I left that company, it was called cellular one. They were owned. I'm sure you remember cellular one. I do. They were owned at the time when I left, they were owned by GTE mobile net and they employed 675,000 people worldwide. Wow. And a week after I left, they got bought by Verizon wireless. Um, but and the, the rest is history. And the rest is history, right? But but the concept of sales, you know, even with all those people that that I was working with in the corporate arena, like everybody understood the concept of sales. Um, I was dealing in commercial sales. Uh, I was also a trainer. I was sales training in this area at the same time that I was a, an account executive. And so, the things I was training on were so far ahead of, honestly where they were in healthcare. And so for a young kid, 10 years out of college, you know, I, I was walking into a planet in healthcare talking a language that I was the only one that knew. And that was extremely exciting for me. Yeah. So, story short. And you're going to have to, I, I get a little long winded here, Lisa, but the long and the short of it is I spent about eight years uh, the first eight years I did this, I was all over the place. I had clients in Western Canada, Vancouver, Calgary, Alberta, Edmonton, um, Barbados in the east, Nassau in the Bahamas in the south, all the way to the Great Lakes. I was gone about 205 days a year. And that's so taxing. Somewhere. And you've been there. You know, yep. you know how that is. Yep. Um, and, you know, something interesting happened. Uh, as you said, I'm from Tennessee. And so I had uh, I'd given somebody permission to hunt on some land. I just flown in from San Diego. I had one night at home. I had to fly out the next day to New Orleans. And my wife picked me up at the airport and said, you know what? You've been going at it hard. Why don't you just go out to the farm? And if nothing else, just watch the sunset. Well, the long and short of it is I had given somebody permission to hunt this land. And he didn't know I was there. And he broke all the rules. He didn't qualify as target. And it was a turkey. It was, it was turkey season. I had turkey all around me. And he evidently was walking the pasture, 
heard the turkey, saw movement, which incidentally was that. It was my head. Oh. So he shot me with a 12 gauge. Oh. About 40 yards right directly into the left side of my head. Oh. And uh, it, was, it was probably one of the greatest things that could ever happen to me. Um, my vocal cords were paralyzed for a year, thanks to the guys at. So uh, were you totally? I mean, could you? I mean, paralyzed. So you could not speak. I could not speak. Um, wow. My vocal cords were paralyzed. You know, your vocal cords sit on top of your windpipe like right. this, and they and they open and close. Mine were were paralyzed, just relaxed. So one part of it is I couldn't speak, but if I got out of breath, they would start vibrating. So I sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> like a, I mean, uh, it's not funny, but it is now. <laughs> it, it, it is now. It's, it's hilarious. But it was, uh, it, was, it was, again, probably one of the best things that happened to me. A major point of clarity in my life. Um, I speak for a living. I train. You know. Um, you sell. I couldn't, I couldn't strategize. Speak. I sell. I strategize. you got to be able to talk. It's all sales. I mean, it's all sales, right? So, um, you know, I had several operations finally that, and, and they got this and you're wondering, you know, what I used to look like before. Cause this is not me. I used to look just like Matthew McConaughey. Totally. Well, there you have it. And, uh, yeah, they, so actually, they actually improved you. That, that. <laughs> and you also got a nice haircut. So I'm super happy about that. Cause I don't think McConaughey looks like he cuts. I, I see him in town all the time. He lives here. And, uh, I don't think he washes it or cuts it ever. Yeah. I, I, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. Yeah. So anyway, I, um, I, I learned the, uh, the old saying that uh, urgent things are not important and important things are not urgent. And that was a major point of clarity for me. So I let me ask you, that, I want to go back to your vocal cords. So sure. you know, they're paralyzed. Did the doctors say that you may never speak again? Or, or, or did they know at some point you would be able to speak again? They didn't know. Um, they sent me to a voice specialist who incidentally, at the time, they had just done the same procedure for rod stewart really and uh, of course it was nashville so all the country music stars had been going through this and and they put me through a series of, of things over a long period of time uh it's it's actually kind of cool to talk about right now they would put this camera down my throat and they would make me say my vowels and then as i'm saying my vowels they record it and then they put all the different vowels on the screen right and you know and, and they could anyway the thing that did it I got this cool scar. I hope you can't see the thing oh, that did it. Your was, makeup artist does a good job. After, after at, at the whole end of it, after about 14 months, they injected cow collagen hmm. and that worked immediately. I don't know why they did all the other things before. Yeah, they did like that. Why did we do that 14 months ago? I, I don't understand all of that. I, I really don't. I had uh, maybe, I, uh, maybe your wife said, you know what? I need him to be quiet for about a year. <laughs> Tell Mr. Her I producer said is back here laughing because yeah, he, he knows my wife. And so that's what that <laughs> <your> statement. <laughs> she rules the roost in my house. I but like yeah, her was, already. You know, it, it was a, it was a very interesting experience. I learned that, you know, um, 205 days a year away from my family, chasing all of those deals that I was chasing, um, it probably wasn't important at the end of the day. And so I had all these clients, a lot of them were doing what they were supposed to do, and a lot of them weren't. I immediately cut my client base by 50%. I kept the ones who were doing exactly what they should be doing and were growing like crazy. And I vowed that I was not going to give of myself again, unless the clients that we're working with are really serious about the growth. And so there you go. I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the down and dirty version of sort of uh, who we are and what we do. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, so tell, let, I want to talk about the fear. Like, you know, you're laying in bed and you're like, you know, this is how I make my living. I speak, I sell. I, you know, I, I have to be able to communicate, to be able to do business. What were you feeling? Like, were you, were you paralyzed with fear, faith? I mean, tell us. I think that's just such an interesting story. And that is a really good question. Talk about fear. The first thing, I was sitting there on a limestone rock. And I, it, it felt like somebody threw water on me. Um, and then I heard, pow. I thought, what in the heck? And I, and I went like this. And I saw it was just covered in blood. And for a second, okay, I realized I'd just been shot. And I stood up and then I thought, whoa, wait a minute. This is my first fear. 
is everything where it should be? Is my eye, that, because if I leave this spot in the woods and my nose is on the ground or my ear is on the ground, I will never find it. And I got to pick it up if it's off because I'm going to have to get it sewn back on, right? That was the first fear. When I realized everything was there, then I got pissed. Were you worried about your brain at any point? You know, <laughs> that, is, that is what houses your brain. Just wondering. No, I, I, I really wasn't. The, the, the mass, the majority of it, unfortunately, went into my neck and, and to the side of my face. Oh. Um, and I still have it. Uh, when I get tired, it, this one, I have a, a, a pellet that pops out right here and I have a couple in my shoulder. And I've got one that's embedded right here. It sticks out. Uh, it drives me nuts. They just couldn't, couldn't get them all out of my skull. But, uh, you know, I never really was afraid. I was never afraid. They, uh, since you're asking the story, I'll tell you. I have to, like, to me, this is more interesting than us talking about selling. I, when I realized what had happened and I realized that everything seemed to be in place, my eyelid was there and my ear was there. Then I realized I couldn't hear. I realized I couldn't see. And then I got pissed though. And I turned around and the guy that shot me was looking at me. He dropped his gun and just screamed at the top of his voice and took off running. And the other thought, way? The other way. And I thought, you Where know what? that dumb guy think he was going out in that field on the farm after he shot the owner? Just wondering. <laughs> well, I was thinking, holy crap, this must be bad. If, if, if the guy that shot me took off running, this must, like, I must really be in bad shape. And I tried to yell at him, and that's when I realized that I couldn't talk. <sighs> So I sat there thinking, okay, this is it. I'm going to be right here, you know, in this spot. Now, was your and wife at the farm with you or at the ranch? No, with I, you? Was, I, was, I was by myself. Oh. And I was a long way from a vehicle. Um, and I started trying to figure out what am I going to do. And about that time, he pulled up in the pasture and threw me into his truck and dialed 911 and just took off flying. And the emergency guys met us at the end of a road, like in an old fire hall. And of course, these guys, Lisa, you can imagine, I mean, they're like, oh, they've been waiting yeah. their whole lives for this, right? I mean, like, they are like, oh, sweet. We, yeah, got we finally got somebody here. <laughs> That's right. So I had all this, I had all this camouflage on, you know, instead of taking it off, all oh, they're ripping out, you know, they're cutting it all up and all, you know, they're just like, you can tell they were loving this. Well, when they, when they cut my clothes off, they had me on a gurney. When they cut my clothes off and threw it open, I heard all the shot hit the concrete floor. And I thought, wow, this, this really is pretty bad. The EMT told me that, you know, you got, Mr. Crabtree, you have a major hematoma right here. We're really concerned about that. We called Life Flight. They should be here in just a minute. Um, as soon as we get you on the helicopter, they'll be monitoring everything at Vanderbilt University. And, uh, and it was just like what you see in te on television, man. I mean, I was, it almost, like, me it's almost like a soldier being shot. It was like a war zone. Well, you know, draw, I mean, but, I, I, mean, I know, certainly would not compare myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you're right. And, and, uh, you know, I never, the whole time the, the nurse was talking to me, she had me hooked up. They were reading the vitals, you know, at the hospital while we were flying there. And she was asking me questions. Of course I couldn't answer. Um, but I never, she asked me if I, if I needed something for pain. And I said, I'm, I'm not really hurting. You know, I mean, I'm not, I was just so numb that I wasn't really hurting. Oh, God. It didn't, uh, it didn't, it didn't like, it never occurred to me that anything serious was going to happen. Uh, we landed on the roof of the, of the uh, hospital and all these surgeons came running out, you know, and they've all got do rags on. I remember they had Budweiser do rags on, you know, and they're, and they're like, running. Oh, great. I'm, I'm getting the drunk surgeons. Yay that's, me. That's right. The partiers. <laughs> but yeah, they, uh, you know, he said, I remember him saying, Mr. Crabtree, uh, you've got a serious, serious hematoma right here. We don't know how close it is to your carotid artery. We've got to operate. And I started trying to say, is it going to leave a scar? What is it going to do? Here you are and, worried about your face again. <laughs> I'm telling you, you might have been a woman in another life. <laughs> Maybe so. But uh, I said. Has anybody called your wife at this point? At, at this point, uh, somehow, I can't remember. Um, somehow somebody contacted somebody. Um, some friends of mine ran to my house, got my wife. My parents, her parents, all of our friends, these guys all were at the hospital shortly after I had gotten, uh, after I went into surgery. 
Um, the interesting thing too, just a great, a little known fact here. Little known fact. That's what I love. I love scoop. Little known fact. If you ever have somebody get shot, they, they change your name. So in other words, they're not going to, you get to the hospital, they're not, you know, I'm looking for Sean Crabtree. Yeah, that's a GSW. That's a gunshot wound. A gunshot wound, they don't give away the real name. So they gave me a fake name like Mark Hawthorne or something like that. I mean, it makes sense because it might have been a murder attempt or something. I never would have thought of that, right? But that's that's one of the- What was your hospital name? Vanderbilt. No, no, no. Um, what was your name? Oh, your, uh, Mark. Your it was like name. it was like Mark Hawthorne or something. <laughs> yeah. You're like, do I have an ear? What does my face look like? I got a new name. Like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> you know what? I should. That should be my new. I should use. I should. I should write that down. It was Mark Hawthorne. Maybe that could be my. Uh, it could be your. It it, it it could be your like fake ID name or something. That'll be my author name. That'll be the. Oh, it could be your author name. I like that. And then and then you could get a little name. more juicy with your books. Right, right. There you go. Yeah. So whatever. Okay. So what happened to the guy that shot you? <laughs> Just have to ask. Um, you know. He's the one who needs to change his name. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. 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 Uh, I mean, he wasn't uh, arrested. Obviously, it was an accident. I was yeah, semi kidding, but. It was an accident, but, uh, but you know, you know, those kind of people, he's one of those kind of people that, um, just bad stuff is always around him. You know, he's just one of those people. I didn't really know him very well. Um, one of my friends knew him and he asked me to hunt and I gave him permission, uh, bad mistake. Obviously that was a big mistake, but, um, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it was an accident and, unfortunately he had several series of bigger accidents after me. Oh Lord. Um, and so I don't even know where he is now, but mm. yeah. I mean, you know, you break all the rules. I mean, you're in Texas, you know, you know, you probably I hunt have yourself. Guns, just for there the you record, go. you, you, you break into my house, you're dead. Cause in Texas I can shoot you on the front porch and drag you inside. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And I will. And we can do that here in Tennessee too. Mm-hmm. You know, but you, yeah. I mean, that's the first thing you do. You don't, you know, you know, the, when you learn to handle a firearm, the first thing yeah. you do is qualify the target. And then you are looking at the backdrop of the target to see where the bullet's going to go. Right. And he just didn't do any of that sort of stuff. Good but again, Lord. it was a total blessing. It allowed I was gonna say, me. I mean, it sounds like it was something that was meant to happen so that you would change the course of your life. And now look how wildly successful you are. And it sounds like you're at home 220 days a year versus on the road. Yes. Yes. And it, it allowed us to really get clear about, you know, who's a good fit for who it is that we're looking for. And, right. So let know, me ask you this, because I think this is important when it comes to sales prospecting, when it comes to, and I'm like you, Sean, I won't just work with anybody. You can throw money at me all day long, but if I, I don't like you, you or I don't see that you've got integrity um, or it's just not a good fit, I, I, I won't work with somebody. And, and I like that about you. But so as we're talking to the big sellers out there and you know, and they're trying to learn how to um, define if a customer is a good fit. Tell us for you, what defines a good fit for a client? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I've narrowed it down to three things. For me, a great client has got to be somebody who has a mindset for growth. They're not stuck in fear. They're not stuck in, uh, you know, a lot of limiting beliefs. The number one focus for them is I want to get where I want to go And I want you to help me get where I want to go. Um, The second thing is they have to uh, have to make a commitment. Yeah. Not only a commitment to us financially, uh, but we usually set that financial commitment in a way that it's a big enough of a uh, why for them to stay engaged, you know? Um, And the third thing is they have to be willing to address their team in a way that is, uh, I call it addressing the obvious, you know, you know, all the big sellers out there who, who work with teams, you know, you understand the concept of how valuable it is that uh, you don't step around a problem and you don't avoid a problem. I mean, if you're trying to grow, the number one thing is you got to hit a problem right between the eyes. I don't mean a people problem. I mean, you have to address the, the obvious, right? You don't just allow it to be there. Those are the three major contributors to what we look for. And sometimes we, you know, sometimes we, we, uh, 
sometimes we let one slip through that, that maybe we didn't it think. It happens. So, you know, so it happens, tell, us, but, tell us how you fire a client or how you release a bad client because I'm telling everybody out there right now, there's no amount of money worth, there's, there's no amount of money in the world to work with a bad client because it will cost you money and mental health in the end. Remember yeah, and we, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we, we communicate on the front end, you know, about how it's going to look. And then when it comes time to, uh, to let it go, it's just, it's not a good fit. It's not working. And that's pretty much it. I mean, yep. that's the way we look at it. I like look Trumpster, at, you're fired. That's right. I mean, I look at my clients as a relationship that I want to be in and I want this to be a beneficial relationship. And if I'm going to invest everything that I have and I do, and I will, because that's what um, we do to that success. Right. Um, then, you know, I, I need to know where you are in that game. And if you're not, uh, if you're not willing to play, then it's not a good fit. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's not a good fit. And I love that you, that number one, that you won't just work with anybody. And that two, that you're not afraid to release a bad client because the bigger seller that you become, the more successful you become in this game of sales, you know, you know, the thing that we sell, you and I both sell it, Sean, we sell success. That's right. And we sell helping people be successful and successful and people don't work with people that they don't want to work with. And I think you've got to really lay the groundwork early in the relationship. And if it's not working, not, you know, don't, don't be led by the money. Walk away because you'll find two more great clients that you enjoy working with because I know you feel like I do. You know, we only go around the sun one time. And the reason I think that you and I are both so successful is because we love what we do. Well, I love what I do because I love the clients that I work with. And the money always follows And that. the money always follows. Always. That, There's no the shortage of money. Do what you love, love what you do, and then and the money will come. There's and no it's shortage the of money. principle in the world. It was probably a Chinese proverb, but I'm trying to say I, I came up with it 20 years <laughs> ago. I don't know. No, that's, and that's, that's true of all of our clientele. I mean, we, we work, we work um, in the healthcare arena. We also work outside of the healthcare arena. Um, we, do, we do sales training. We do strategy training with reps um, in the industry all over the U.S., uh, actually about nine states. Uh, that is a lot of fun, too. I mean, that is, you know, uh, working with the doctors like I work with and the people in healthcare. I mean, that's, that's a blast, taking them to from where they are to where they want to be. But getting to work with salespeople directly, too, that's kind of where my home is. That's kind of where my heart is. Right. Um, that's, that's what I'm most excited about, I think, right now is, is what we're doing with sales reps in the distribution side. Yeah. And it's, it's so important because I mean, you know, when you help contribute to build a strong sales force, and I've said this forever, you know, I, the, you know, the only economic stimulus package I believe that this country ever needs is a strong sales force. And right. I mean, forget, forget teaching people how to do anything, teach them how to sell. You know, they might be selling shoes, skirts, cars, real estate, training, consult, it doesn't matter. But you know, you know, you want to teach somebody to be successful, teach them how to sell. You know, I'd, I'd love to know. I mean, this is an awesome group that you have, right? The big sellers. I'd love to know um, of all the people that are in this group. I'd love to know how many of them were told, like I was told as a child, you know what? If you just learn how to sell, everything will be okay. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what you do. If you will learn the art of the sale. Yes. You can. And you know what is so funny? My dad was an entrepreneur and he told me that. So I've been selling I was my told whole the life. same thing. Yep. Yeah. And, and in fact, you know, the first to, to like game that I can remember that my dad bought me was Donald Trump's uh, The Art of the Sell or The uh, Art of the Sale. Awesome. Um, was it, what was it? No, Art of the, the Art of the Deal. Art, art of the Deal. deal. I mean, I still deal. have the game somewhere. It's got to be worth something, right? But it was a board right. game and, you know, my dad, I mean, my dad has been passed away for 10 years, but he would be one happy dude right now with uh, Trump sitting there in office. So I can tell you that yeah. he loved that guy. Um, but that being said, you know, I'd love for you to post a video in our group and ask that question because I think it's a great question. And I'm going to bet the majority of the people I would did think not so. have the same experience we did. I, I, I would think I would think that's exactly the case. Um, I, I can't be the, the only person or you and I can't be the only people who were told that. Right. Um, no, absolutely. I, I was told a lot of things, but that was, that was one of them. Yeah. And it's just interesting because, you know, so many people, you know, they say to me all the time, they're like, oh God, I'm just terrified to sell. You know, I would much rather have 
a, a job where I've got a guarantee. And I'm like, really, you want to be mediocre? You want to be stuck your whole life? Do you want to know that you're never going to make any more money? So the house you're living in right now, take a good look at it because you're not moving out of it. You're not right. moving up. You know, that car, you better hurry up. You better hope it, hurry, it gets paid for pretty quickly because you can't afford another one or a new one. And so that's just, it's such a small mentality, but there really is. And I think you'd agree, Sean, there's really just 1% of the people in the world who have our mentality and they're willing to put it on the line every I single agree. day. I, listen, I totally agree. And I'm in this conversation on a daily basis. I'm cutting videos on this conversation on a daily basis. If, listen, here's the thing. You know, you know, you can be like a super seller. You can be, you know, part of this group and be in the big sale, or you can consider yourself, I'm in business and I'm not in sales. Listen, if you are in business, you are in sales. If you lead a team, you're in sales. It, if you answer the telephone it, and you're a receptionist, it's all, you're yes. in sales. Because if you ever want to get off of that receptionist job, you better be able to sell right. somebody on the fact that you need to move up. Right. I was, I was interviewing somebody the other day and he was for, uh, he was a, a marketing company and he was the CEO of a marketing company and he said something and I, I didn't know quite whether I should let it go. We had the clock going, but he said, you know, um, I've been in marketing for a lot of years and I, and I, um, I didn't, I don't like sales. Uh, I'm not a salesperson. I don't see myself as sales because when I've I think of a salesperson, I think of a vacuum cleaner kind go of. Go ahead and say it. You want to say car salesman. And car salesman. <laughs> and you know what? I mean, here's the thing. Here's, and I, I think I'm the one that coined this phrase, okay? Okay. Um, there is a reason that salespeople are the highest paid people on the planet. It's because it's a profession. It is a profession. And there are bad vacuum cleaner salespeople and bad car salespeople, just like there are bad judges, just like there are bad attorneys, just like there are bad lawyers or, you know, fill in, medical doctors, fill in the blank, sure. dentists, right? But there's a reason that salespeople are the highest paid people on the planet because it's a profession and people who are great at it are exceptionally professional and they understand the concept of getting what they want and they understand that being a great salesperson is creating value and it's all about that relationship and they understand all of that it's 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 almost a little bit selfish too because if you're a great salesperson you're you kind of like get to be the hero all the time all the time i love it you know um i have a really good friend and and he, he said to me one time and i i've never forgot it he said you know it doesn't matter how bad things get if you're in the financial hole or whatever it is, but because if you know how to sell, you can yes. sell your way out of anything. That's right. You can sell That's your way out of anything, any financial problem, any burden you might have, just get busy, go sell something. If you are in a hole, sales is the biggest shovel to get out. Oh, I like that down there. I mean, you can just see, I just, I have this vision of just digging out, but that's, <laughs> but, but it gives us the opportunity to dig out. If, if I want to go buy a new bigger house or, I got my eye on this new uh, Land Rover that I think I'm going to have to own is Range Rover. So I don't know. We'll see. Anyways, I thought, well, and I literally drove down the street the other day and I, you know, the car is about 160 grand. And I thought, yeah, it's about, to, I think I'm gonna buy that car. And I thought, okay, this is how much, this is what I got to do. I got to do this. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to push and get this other contract signed. And then I'm gonna go buy the car. There you go. And so this That's morning I was like on the phone. I, mean, I never even worked that hard anymore. And I'm on the phone going, Hey, you know, that contract at last, come on, let's go. He's like, isn't God, that the really American push. dream? I, go, I want a new car. <laughs> I mean, isn't that the American dream? Isn't that is. the American dream? I it mean, is. that's the American dream. And you know what? Here's the way I look at it. We were born in the greatest country on earth, and we get to have whatever it is that we want to have if we understand that that's the way it works. How to get there. Then we, we make use of this wonderful gift that we've been given. Our creator gives us everything that we need to maximize whatever it is that we want in the greatest country on earth. I agree. If you're not, listen, if you're not going after it, what are you doing? You're pissing it away. You are. And you're wasting valuable time. And I was laughing as I, as I was thinking about it yesterday, I thought I'm sitting here selling myself on the fact that I deserve this car and I want it because I'm quite the car person. <laughs> and then I'm selling myself on the fact that I'm going to work a little bit harder, not because I have to, but because in my mind, then I'm just, I'm just going to buy the car. 
And, but I think that that's how salespeople work, you know? And so the best thing in the world is that you can become a big seller. So Sean, I hate to have to wrap this up because good Lord, you and I could talk all day long. How will people work with you? Now we're going to have everything in the show notes and, but how, how can somebody work with the Crabtree Group? Find us at the Crabtree Group. Oh, the, com. The, the, as in like two. it. The Crabtree Group com, and you can uh, connect with us and find out all about us there and contact us and everything and, and follow us on social media. And by the way, thank you for inviting me into this group. I'm going to be your biggest poster. I'm telling Good. you, it, it's like a goal. I'm going to throw it out. I'm going to start. You Good. guys are going to get so. I need people like you contributing because that's what we have so many young people in this group, so many young sellers, you know, and they send me these notes and. Uh, this one little gal from Dell and she's just darling. And I've known her since her first career. And she sent me out. She says, thank you so much for inviting me. I know I'm going to learn a lot. And I said, I better see you in here participating. Yep. Contributing. That's why I that's, invited you because right. there's an incredible amount of wisdom yourself included in this group and it's free. You need to take advantage of it. It's free. And, and I learn from everybody all day long, just because I got this gray right here. doesn't mean that I got it all figured out. I'll tell you that. And That's right. As soon as I get to the point where I got, I think I got it all figured out. I'm in trouble. That's right. Well, Sean, thank you so much for your Lisa, time, you. for your expertise, for your wisdom. Um, I really enjoyed it. Everybody out there, uh, the trap, the crab Sean Crabtree. Thank you again. Thank and you. big sellers until next time. I'll see you again. Sell big. Sell big. We like big sellers.